Prepare to walk. I'm gonna get up this next rapids before nightfall. Get her up in the air and climb those falls. Hodig! This project was inspired by one of my favorite crafters on YouTube, Boy Lie Hobby Time, and his Wild Imaginary West. Three main things separate the Wild Imaginary West from the Wild Ordinary West. Electric tech, walking machines, and monsters. We move it east a bit to the Wild Imaginary Midwest, to the site of what may have been one of the very first clickbaits. A bunch of recent immigrants living in Pennsylvania felt they needed another new start, saw a poster for a place called Wisconsin, formulated a plan and went for it. The poster showed a train and paddle wheeler pulling into the town. As the first group approached the new land, they inquired about taking that steamship the rest of the way and were met with laughter. The only ways to finish a journey were walking or taking a canoe and portaging around all the rapids and waterfalls. There was no way a paddle wheel steamship could ever go up that river, unless it had legs. Our paddle wheeler is going to be a walker to climb up waterfalls and rapids. Why does the Wild Imaginary West have walking machines? I don't know, but it could have been something like this. Hey, check out my new electric motor. These are going to revolutionize the world. Yes, you should put some on a wagon, power the wheels, and get rid of the horse. It could go amazingly fast, probably cover 50 miles in an hour. That's a great idea. I'll get to work on it right away. Ha, engineer wants to make everything into a train. Need carefully manicured paths to travel on, smooth as a billiard board, not too steep, bridges everywhere. Nope, the problem isn't the horse, it's the wagon. You should make a mechanical version of a horse, size it up, and build a wagon onto its back. It could travel anywhere a horse could, but faster and carrying more. Eureka! That's what we'll do. Imagine if I had made motorized wagons. All those fancy paths crisscrossing everywhere, a horrible idea. This time next year, we'll all be riding motorized mechanical horses. We start with the paddle wheeler. The models that are the right size are the wrong scale, and the ones that are the right scale are the wrong size. So we're going to scratch build it based off some drawings. We start with a paper pattern and a piece of XPS foam and carve it into the basic shape of the hull. After the rough shaping, it was sanded smooth, then given a coat of Mod Podge to protect it in later painting processes. Next, we build the superstructure by marking out the dimensions on a piece of styrene, cutting the parts out, and gluing them together. The first floor is made of two boxes, a slightly larger one at the rear near the drive. Now the roof of the first story is measured and cut, the rounded corners are sanded smooth, and it's glued to the first floor walls. The parts for the second story are laid out and cut, then glued together. Walls for the pilot's cabin are scored and snapped, then glued together like the first two stories. Now I realize there are no details to suggest the wood that the walls are made from, so I scribe board lines after the first two stories were assembled. Definitely the hard way to do it. With the lines scribed, I use a wire brush to add some grain detail to the boards. Now an opening for the stairs from the main deck to the second floor is cut out of the second floor deck. Some simple four pane and clear story windows along with narrow doors were 3D printed and glued to the first story, which is then glued to the hull. More doors and windows get glued to the second story, which then gets glued on top of the first floor. Some more 3D printed details. A ladder goes on next. Gingerbread details get glued to the top of the pilot house. The staircase from the first to second floors is fabricated from the same sheet styrene. Two side pieces and eight individual steps glued together. Next, the steps are glued in place on the vessel. Window holes are cut in the pilot house, as painting the panes black on such a small structure doesn't work well. Some scrap windows were cut to size and glued in, then the interior was painted black. Now, it is glued to its commanding position atop the boat. Posts are added tying the deck up through the roof of the second story and providing a place to tie off rope railings. Now the namesake of the ship is constructed, the paddle wheel itself. We start with the side, built from even more styrene. A second side is made and the paddles are cut. The sides get glued to a wire shaft and the paddles are assembled to the sides. Cranks were cut out and affixed to the sides to give the drive rod something to attach to and drive the wheel. Rings are crafted from copper wire wrapped around a pipe and glued to the outer perimeter of the wheel. 
Time to mount the paddle wheel to the ship. A paper template is made to get the position right, then two identical mounting braces are cut out. Holes are drilled through to fit the shaft, and the braces are spot glued with the paddle wheel in place to ensure proper location. Once it's in place, everything is glued securely. The first greebly is attached to the support, then the drive rods are attached between the crank on the wheel and the powerhouse. The legs are made from craft sticks, cut to length, with the ends rounded over and holes drilled to accommodate round toothpicks for joints. Greeblies are added to suggest actuators and motors, with some flat cutout details on the upper legs to provide interest while allowing them to fold behind the lowers. Clearance pockets for the legs to tuck into the hull are marked out, then the pockets are carefully carved and the excess popped away. The hull and pockets are given a coat of filler and sanded smooth, then the legs are fitted into place. The electronic components are fitted to the top of the ship. One of their functions is to help keep monsters at bay, but judging from how often monster encounters occur, they're not super reliable. Now the model is primed, painted, and weathered, except I didn't like the way it turned out, so I started over with priming. The superstructure gets gray and the hull gets rust brown to allow chipping later on. One of the things I didn't like about the first paint job was the chipping painted over the base coat. It just doesn't come out as good as using hairspray or chipping fluid. To represent long scratches on the bottom of the hull from running over rocks and logs in the rivers, I coat links of thread with rubber cement and lay them on the hull before painting. Everything gets a healthy coating of hairspray, then the color coat. When the paint is partially dry, the threads are pulled off. I'm hoping for a rough, tattered edge between the paint and rust underneath, and that's what we get for the most part. More chipping is done to the hull using the traditional water and stiff brush method. A dark gray base is sprayed on the superstructure to facilitate chipping. The newest exposed wood weathers to a dark gray, then the older wood in the middle of large exposed areas can be brush painted to a lighter, more weathered gray. A coat of hairspray is applied, then the top half of the ship is painted antique white. All of the posts are painted red, followed by the windows and doors. The superstructure is then chipped using water and a stiff brush. The result is much better than the first paint job. The smokestacks and main staircase are painted apple barrel mountain blue. The gingerbread on the pilot house also gets that shade of blue. The electronic equipment gets painted Vallejo metal color steel, as do all the details on the legs. The paddle wheel takes quite a beating, so it gets remnants of paint sponged on. The smokestack rigging is painted black. The rope railings are painted a tan ropey color. The whole model gets an acrylic black wash. Details are brought out with a black oil wash, essentially a pin wash. The hull gets rust chips in various colors. A little rust wash in the right areas and the boat is done. We have two parts of the Wild Imaginary West, now we need the third, the monster. That is going to be the Hodag. According to Wikipedia, in American folklore, the Hodag is a fearsome critter resembling a large bullhorned carnivore with a row of thick curved spines down its back. The hoed egg had the head of a frog, the grinning face of a giant elephant, thick short legs set off by huge claws, the back of a dinosaur, and a long tail with spears at the end. The hoed egg was said to be born from the ashes of cremated oxen as the incarnation of the accumulated abuse the animals had suffered at the hands of their masters. With the incarnation of abuse aspect of the creature, I gave him the horns of various animals on his back, rather than just a row of spikes. Seems more fitting with the supernatural amalgamation of suffering. I modeled the hoed egg in Blender and 3D printed him. This is a neat trick I saw on YouTube. Soaking the print in hot water lets it pop away from the supports rather than cutting every individual support away from the model. The model was printed hollow, which requires drain holes, which are now filled with Tamaya putty and sanded smooth. The hot egg gets a black base coat, then a white zenithal highlight. His base color is applied with the green craft paint thinned down to glaze consistency. It takes several coats to get the desired saturation. The gradual buildup allows retaining the highlights and shadows of the zenithal prime. His mouth gets the same treatment with red. His horns, teeth, and claws get a base coat of antique white. Frog and snake eyes help define what the hot egg's eyes should look like. Snakes all seem to have vertical eye slits, so I take a red and yellow pattern from a frog and make the pupils vertical to signal that this is a predator. I want him to have mangy patches of long fur tying back to the oxen origin. Some quick drying tacky glue holds longer static grass that gets combed downward, then some shorter grass goes above that sticking straight out. A base coat of brown is airbrushed onto the fur patches. Lighter browns and tans are dry brushed on the fur to give definition with the highlights. 
Now it's time to hold my breath and trust the process. The Hoda gets an all-over wash with brown oil paint thinned with some odorless thinner. Not to worry, it comes out exactly as I expect. Details are emphasized and the horns now look very much the part with subtle color variations. Next is a black oil wash to mute the colors a bit and bring out the details, much the same way as a pin wash. A few areas get a second hit to emphasize them a bit more, like around the eyes. And that completes the hot egg. We have the elements, now it's time to put together the diorama. The paddle wheeler goes on one side. The bases of the trees the hot egg knocks over to use as a boarding ladder anchor the other. The hot egg goes on the trunks and the waterfall and rapids underneath the boat. Everything is marked out with a pencil, then outlined with a sharpie. I want to branch out from the typical rectangle, so this base gets a free form outline just big enough to house all the elements. The pattern is traced onto a piece of XPS foam and cut out with a hot wire cutter. A piece of half inch foam is cut for the upper river and a one inch thick piece for the bank. They are glued together with urethane glue and left to dry. Plaster gets sculpted into the rocks that make up the rapids in the face of the waterfall, getting worked until it sets up. PVA glue goes down and gets spread around with a brush, followed by plaster chips to represent shards of the rocks that make up the falls and rapids, small stones, and dirt from my backyard. The base ground cover is brushed off the rock carvings. Everything was wetted with isopropyl alcohol, then soaked down with diluted PVA glue. I found two things that create realistic water. The first is painted contrast on the bottom, so I start with a medium tan base coat for the river, light tan highlights in the shallower areas, and brown in the deeper areas. The rocks get a mostly gray base coat. Some of the granite Wisconsin has a reddish to pinkish cast, so I throw in some reds too. All the small stones get a lick of paint and everything gets some dry brushed highlights. The whole riverbed gets a brown oil wash to make all the texture pop. The bank gets a dark brown base coat to represent the rich forest soil, followed by some airbrushed highlights. All the stones again get a lick of paint to make them pop, and everything gets an oil wash. The edge of the bank gets layers of static grass, starting with short lengths and getting progressively longer as we approach the edge of the river where it would get more light. A few tufts are added deeper in the forest. The grass gets a spray of green to tie it all together. The forest floor gets a spritz of hairspray, then some ground leaf litter to finish the look. The waterfalls get dams from UV cure resin to keep the epoxy for the upper river in the upper river. The waterfalls get constructed from cotton, pulled and stretched into shape. Cotton also makes white water around the rocks and the rapids. The final cotton work gets a shot of hairspray to hold it in place, hopefully. Now we hit a critical point, attaching the walking paddle wheeler to the diorama. This is touchy, I have to get it into an interesting pose and affix it securely to the base. I start by raising it into position with some 1-2-3 blocks, then positioning the feet in places that look interesting, plausible, and hold the model up. Once the legs are in place, I lock them as much as possible with super glue, both at the knee and hip joints. Once they are locked, I mark the foot positions with a marker so I can get it back in the same position after removing the one, two, three blocks. Once the blocks are out, it's a matter of tweaking, gluing, and spraying with accelerator until it's in place. With the ship affixed to the base, the feet can be added to the bottom of the legs. The feet are half circles that can fold up flat against the legs when stowed, but fold out and support the ship when walking. On to the trees. The trunks of the trees are made from some dowels that need a taper, but the sandpaper is going far too slow. Luckily, I have a small hobby lathe that's just right for this job. Grain is carved into the trunks with a utility knife, then it's onto the branches. My first thought is to twist them up from wire, but I don't have the right size wire on hand. The backup plan is to 3D print the branches. I drop some branches in a collar and blender, then stick the branches onto the collar so they can be slid onto the trunk. The branches get tack and glue around the edges and four millimeter static grass to represent the ramification at the ends of the branches. The branches and the trunks get some gray paint with various dry brushed highlights. After the paint dries, we use more tacky glue and two millimeter static grass to add the needles to the branches. Rinse and repeat until we have enough to trim a tree, two trees. The branches slide down the trunks and get arranged to provide the best look. The tops are a little bare, so some 12 millimeter grass goes at the top for branches and then more two millimeter needles to finish it off. I made some root structures to mount the trees to the base from oven baked clay and they're now getting painted. The trees are mated to the roots with epoxy. Then when dry, they're fitted to the base. Mounting the trees is critical to get everything to fit so the trees meet with the ship 
and fit the hoed egg's legs. Once the trees were affixed, I used a mock-up to figure out exactly where the hoed egg's feet would land, then started bending the branches he crashed through on his way to the boat, along with giving some a bit of curve for interest. Now that everything is attached to the diorama, it's time to pour the resin. Duct tape serves as a dam for the upper river with some UV cure resin for extra leakage insurance. Now, I have a brand new 64 ounce. Are we gonna use this? No. We're gonna use this, and this, and this, until we run out. Oh, anticipation. Is this? Well, this is no longer liquid. The pour on is still good, and here's my second trick for realistic water. Carbon nanoparticles in the lower layers. Light drops off rapidly as it travels through water, so having the carbon suspended in the resin simulates this effect without leading heavily on colors or dyes. The resin gets poured, the base gets tilted around to make sure everything's covered, then it sets up overnight. The lower river is sealed off with duct tape and UV resin, the last batch of leftover resin is mixed up with carbon powder, and then it gets poured. Once the lower river cures, the last batch of resin gets mixed up and poured over both the upper and lower river sections. Now that everything's cured, we pull off the dam. Luckily, there were no leaks anywhere. Since this is white water, the choice for creating waves is clear caulk. It takes better to sculpting and gives more texture than Mod Podge. Everything gets a good coat and then sculpted with heavier texture below the falls. Our boat needs some people. I printed out some cowboys to remedy this. They get a zenithal highlight, then hit with glazes until the colors look right, and finished off with an oil wash to bring out the details. Now the Gatling guns, the gunners, the monster hunter, the captain, and the cowgirl all take their places on the boat. Boilei often paints the edges of his dioramas with black 3.0, which has an interesting story. It starts with Vanta Black, which isn't a paint at all, but a coating applied with vapor deposition. The coating is an array of carbon nanotubes arranged vertically, hence vertically aligned nanotube arrays, or Vanta. It's not much use for models, as it requires a temperature of 400 C or 752 Fahrenheit to apply. The interesting part starts with Anish Kapoor, an artist who holds an exclusive license to use Vanta Black in art. Apparently, claiming exclusive use of a color doesn't sit well with the artistic community because they invented Black 1.0, a very black pigment you had to mix into a paint, which was followed by Black 2.0 and 3.0, which were paints themselves. In order to buy Black 3.0, at the checkout, you have to certify that you're not Anish Kapoor or one of his agents. He gets Vanta Black, everyone else gets Black 3.0. I am not using Vanta Black or Black 3.0. I'm using Vanta Brown, a color which I invented and is the brownest brown in the entire universe, and no one can use it but me, and Boilei, and anyone else who wants to pay $29.99 for a bottle of brown craft paint, but not Anish Kapoor. You know what? Let's heal the rift. Even Anish Kapoor can use Vanta Brown, as long as he's got $29.99. Next, we dry brush some white caps and highlight the flow around the rocks and other things downstream. This build was an absolute blast. I had so much fun shifting the wild imaginary west to the wild imaginary midwest, creating my walking paddle wheel steamboat, bringing the hoed egg to life, and putting it all together. I wanted to link to Boilei's wild imaginary west playlist, but it doesn't seem possible. So here's a link to a stagecoach versus bison monster vid, and something YouTube thinks you'll be interested in. If you like Boilei's work, you can hit his channel and then the playlist. Please hit the like button if you enjoyed this video, and subscribe if you'd like to see more from me. Thanks for watching!